I'm a transsexual man, um, but I'm also very gender fluid and very androgynous. Um, I feel like I'm always it kind of I've always kind of been in the middle, um, a very androgynous man, like a, either a feminine man or a masculine woman. But I've always identified with a male pronoun. I identify primarily as a man and. Um, a transsexual man or an FTM or a trans man would be the easiest way to, to categorize my identity and my body. I would say that I identify as being queer or butch. I have days where I feel more like female, like almost like lesbian, and then days where I'm like super like masculine. I still use uh, female pronouns. I do realize that I don't fit into the traditional form of she. But I feel like there's, for those words, there's, there's lots of room in it. I identify as gay or les queer, whatever. I knew like around seven, something was really off uh, when I started standing up to pee in the toilet. I don't have any brothers. <laughs> I'm the oldest of four children. And my mom caught me and she kind of freaked out. You know, when I came out, there weren't hardly any um, FTM people in the media. Uh, like Buck Angel, I think, was the first person that I had ever heard of. I want to talk about being trans, and honestly, I don't really necessarily identify as a trans person. I do identify more as a male. If you've ever been in a situation where you've tried to, to um, convince people that you're something else, if you are trying to, you know, you, you don't want to cover because you don't have the great job that you think you should have, or this or that, those kind of things are what it's like for a trans person to live in their birth body. Because you're constantly having to live up to these expectations everybody has of you because of that physical element that really isn't what's there. And it's liberating when you can finally let go of that. Until you've done something about it, until you've started to change who you are, to really line up with who you are inside until you've started to take those steps. You don't understand what you were missing previously. Being able to be in my own skin and feeling comfortable, you know, being who I am and representing who I am um, definitely makes me happy. Um, I do not have to fight um, much discrimination as I would if I had not transitioned. Just being able to be honest openly to family, friends, I, I'm at an age and I've gone through all the things people in my position generally go through to get to the point where you can just be yourself. I get to be me. I get the world to see me as the person that I always have felt like and the way people interact with me and the way that I get to just speak and be and be in my own skin and, and because before I was so depressed and unhappy in the world and people looked at me as a female, though inside I always felt this maleness. Um, I feel like I'm able to pursue what makes me happy. I like to be physical, I enjoy outdoor activities, I like to be, uh, in my job I'm pretty aggressive and very confident and I don't feel anything pulling me back. It's very liberating to be your own person and be your own person within the career field that you are in. I've never been happy prior to transition. And um, even my mom commented on how much more I smile and how happy I seem. Now, just being myself, I can actually get things done in life. I think just being complete as a person and knowing who I am now, that makes me happy because I don't have to pretend or hide or be someone that I'm not. You know, I don't really know that I really feel like being trans has brought me joy and satisfaction, it just feels like that's who I am. I'm really grateful that I was able to be born in this age, in this era, this time, that I could change things that didn't feel right to me. Uh, this sense of enlightenment that I feel like I have as, as a trans person, and, and it, in many ways it feels like you're part of this club of people who really truly understand gender and uh, the, the, the fluidity of it and the rich tapestry of the human sexuality. Um, there's, there's so much about being trans that kind of feels like a liberation. I knew when I was like really young, like five, um, that I was different. I didn't know how, obviously, I was five, but I didn't fit in right. I didn't think the same way 
I probably should have. Like, uh, you know, my parents tried to get me to do boy things, and uh, they tried to get me to act a certain way. And for the most part, I, I didn't fit into what they wanted to mold me into. And I, I just felt different and awkward, even through like middle school and through high school, I, I felt out of place and sometimes I felt myself doing ridiculous things just to uh, get attention and friends because I didn't know how to do it properly. And it wasn't until I was like 13, 14 ish that I found out uh, how I was different, which is uh, I was trans. There was this boy that I used to go to in my neighborhood and I would go hang out with him and play trucks. I hated trucks, I hated anything to do with boy stuff. I always played the female role and when we played superheroes, <laughs> I was always the opposite of whoever was Superman, I was Wonder Woman or whatever. I was in high school at the heyday of dial-up internet, so I did some wild things as a teenager to meet people that were gay. Um, I had sex as a teenager <laughs> with older men. My dad tried so hard to get me to be on the sports team and I tried several things, baseball, basketball, football. I was always the worst player. I didn't seem to make any friends. I didn't have a lot of friends when I was in high school. Like a lot of people made fun of me when I was in high school because um, they weren't sure if I was a boy or a girl. And most of them thought I was a girl. And then, you know, they would call roll call you know, at the beginning of the year. And then, you know, I'd raise my hand to my old name and, um, people would look at me like, that's not you. I actually told my family that they named me wrong, and I won't tell all the details, but um, that I was a little girl and I came down the stairs in a sheet I made into a gown and thought that I was fabulous, and I thought that they were silly, that they didn't recognize that I was a girl, um, and that was really a turning point for them to realize. So I was able to get past a lot of obstacles, I think, uh, that some transgender youth deal with as teenagers with family, very early on. I generally felt more comfortable around my gender and saw how having me not being the same sex as them, having nothing but girlfriends um, wouldn't be too good for me in school because I saw people like that getting beat up and I was like I don't want to get beat up so so basically I from there I started kind of developing this whole act I'm running away from my transsexualism. I got in a lot of trouble. I mean, I was in and out of juvenile, I went to juvenile boot camp. I was a very, very troubled youth. But it was just because I had all these demons inside of me that was just like, you know, you'll never be who you're gonna be, so just keep running. Well, I was raised by a single mom. My dad died when I was six months old in a car crash, and I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian church that was very much opposed to my beliefs and values as a humanist. It was rough. It was really rough. I didn't, I didn't pass as a boy and I didn't even know that there was such a thing as trans people. I was raised in an environment where just to even talk about being gay was considered sinful. Like to even talk about gay people other than condemning them was considered like inappropriate. And then I started to transition before anybody had even ever told me there were trans people. And I started telling my friends that I thought I was a girl. And then they explained to me that there was such a thing as trans people. I was a terrible child. <laughs> I, uh, oh, wow. I was a clever child, though, so I made it through school okay. You know, I graduated on time and everything, but I was, you know, very rebellious. I, uh, used to do a lot of substances, you know. I used to sell substances and all this, and I was very depressed and always depressed and angry. I was a very angry child <laughs> because I knew about myself from very early on and I knew what I wanted to do and I knew that I couldn't do it until I was at least out of high school. Like I would get just teased a lot back then in preschool and um and uh I would get like um 
like beaten by them a little bit and it was um pretty rough i don't remember like all of it but um i was told by my parents that i would come home with like really like deep like dark like bruises and stuff and back then i would go to like the bathroom and apparently and that's where it would like happen you know they would like uh beat me up in there and do thing and like and like pee on me i was horribly depressed um High school, I almost didn't even graduate because um, I just, I would just sleep in all my classes. That's how depressed I was. It was to the point where I just couldn't even function. I was doing absolutely nothing. When I was about seven or eight years old, I think I just got tired of being passed around from family member to family member. So I started looking after myself and started being independent. And I'm a fighter. Like they would tell me that I was a loser and that I was never going to go anywhere and I was making bad choices with becoming a woman. and all this other crap, and I just would never let it get to me. Growing up, it was always, I never really understood myself. I was still experiencing, you know, life, sexuality. You know, was I attracted to women? Was I attracted to men? Growing up, I'm a boy, I'm supposed to chase girls, or fall in love with a girl, and hold hands and kiss, but I did all that, but at the same time, I noticed myself being sexually attracted to men. It wasn't until I came across my first transsexual, and I was so intrigued and learning so much, asking him questions. Like I was just so curious, and I was like, this is who I am. This is who I want to be, and this was later in high school. But as for transitioning, you know, I did it after high school. I grew up in Boise, Idaho. So, and I always knew that I was like, that I was a, I was a girl, and even though I was just a normal boy. Um, so I learned pretty quickly that like, in Boise, Idaho, it was like, at that time, it, it was, it would like, it was not an option to like, to be the real me, because uh, it would I would have lost my whole youth, you know, I would have been this like, I would have been teased or made fun of or maybe even killed, I don't know, you know? <laughs> um, so I just knew I had to like buy my time and say, you know, and, and I would like, I would like, you know, dress up when, when you know, if, if, I, if I could, but it was like a big secret, I couldn't let any, anybody know, couldn't let anybody know. So yeah, I was just really just like uh, trying to pretend like I was a normal boy so I could do all the normal boy boy things like go to parties and have sex with girls and you know get in trouble and uh, do drugs and you know all this all this fun stuff. So I had actually a great youth, but I just always knew that someday um, when I wasn't so scared that I would um, you know I would finally find the, the courage to, to, to be me. Well, I've always felt that I was different, and it took a really long time for me to actually find myself. I've lived, you know, a homosexual life, I've lived um, a straight life, and before, and after all that, that's when I found out that, you know, my gender is different, not my sexual preference. I've known just before puberty that I know that being a boy wasn't going to be the end-all be-all for me, that there was something else going on. And I'd say around the age of 16 or 17, it really hit home that this is something I needed to do to, to pursue transition. Um, I didn't have the resources when I was uh, late teens, early 20s. I wasn't able to do anything truly about it. Um, until I became financially stable. I went through a lot of dysphoria. I was extremely suicidal in middle school and high school, um, but it wasn't until I transitioned, until I started feeling like I'm living life and enjoying myself, I guess, in a fuller way that I didn't understand back then. But I feel like being trans, it's a lot of external stuff with how you're being treated. Where it's not necessarily, being trans isn't necessarily hard, it's how people perceive you when you're trans. It's really difficult. 
When I was younger, I was very utilitarian in my dress. I wasn't happy with the clothes. You know, there was no reason to express myself in, in what I wore because I wasn't going to find anything that interested me. I would wear punk rock t-shirts, I would wear tattered t-shirts. I went through phases just like most people in high school. Like, I was a goth kid and like, you know, hung out with like a lot, a lot of hardcore punk kids and stuff like that. Um, and I think part of it's just like growing up and like learning how to like present myself um, as a man that people would take more seriously, you know. I mean, yeah, I still have like piercings and stuff like that and I'm gonna look like a young boy for probably the next like 20 years. But, you know, uh, I think uh, just like any other adult, you just find things that work for you better and you evolve from that. I mean, I always identified with, you know, the punk community that, you know, girls didn't have, they could dress like, you know, hard ass, ripped up, you know, whatever you wanted. Nobody, you, there wasn't really judgment there. My dad would always have me dressed up in like little skinnies and like t-shirts and Doc Martens and whatever. He was taking me fishing with him, off-roading. He did all the masculine stuff. I used to have long hair, very feminine. I lived on the beach and was very into being feminine looking. And uh, that changed probably in my late 20s. And I started to get more masculine looking and really sort of took that on inside as well and felt more comfortable. And I felt that I'm more of, of who I really am just looking this way that I do. And I'm sure that this will be how I end the rest of my days. I'll be looking something like this. Intermediate school, um, it was the 90s. So baggy clothes was very popular back then. And I, I sort of gravitated more towards the baggy jeans and the, the oversized like band t-shirts and stuff like that. Um, and I really stuck out. I went to a small school uh, in Hawaii and everybody was very girly, you know, they had the flowers in their hair and here I was with my Doc Martens and, you know, band t-shirts. Um, and since then, I've always sort of gravitated towards uh, men's clothes. But sometimes I change it up, like I'm wearing women's jeans because I'm fancy. I became sexually active when I was 13 and um, and I was, I was fairly confident. I was a really good communicator. Um, I was kind of like precociously so um, in my youth for no particular reason. My parents were pretty conservative. There were two things. I still had not had an orgasm and I have really long inner labia and I was super like tormented about it because I watched a lot of porn. Um, I was like on the internet as soon as my family had a computer, like looking at porn. And nothing I saw was representative of like how I looked physically. It wasn't until I started sleeping with women and people who had the same equipment as I did, more or less, that I, number one, I had never been exposed to so many vaginas in my life. I was born in San Francisco and I was raised in San Francisco and the South. So we moved to Arkansas when I was like eight years old. So I had that total um, weird like city and country. And also um, when I was growing up, cause I'm 40 now. So it was very segregated. I was often a loner. Um, I felt like I didn't get along with a lot of people and maybe that's also like a disinterest in gender activities or gendered activities because I kind of felt like I didn't belong. As a kid, I had no idea that the identity that I have now even exists. So growing up being very masculine aligned, literally, you know, hanging out with the boys, trying to dress like the boys, getting haircuts like the boys, etc., etc. literally having my third grade teacher ask me, what was wrong with me? Do you want to be a boy? There was hardship growing up and all the different ways that, you know, I didn't fit in and things didn't totally line up as a kid. It took a long time until I even had the idea, the awareness that this was something that could happen. When I was a kid, I like came out as queer, as bisexual, like in eighth grade. Um, so I, you know, I've never been in the closet about my sexuality or, or anything like that. Um, but it took me a long time to just be okay with the fact that I am feminine and genderqueer because I wasn't getting read. There's literally no visibility. You don't look at me and say, oh, that person's genderqueer, like the way that you would look at Jisley and say, oh, that person is genderqueer, you know, um, because they look like they're in the middle of the spectrum presentation wise. I did play dress up. I played dress up with friends and I would say I'm, I was socialized female. So I had, um, while I was maybe more tomboy of the, some of the friends that I had, um, I had a bunch of different kinds of friends, like the majority of my, 
my childhood was outside in nature. And, and I feel like if I had any kind of root in my general feeling of like not really attached to either male or femaleness, it was just being in nature and just being like out hiking and climbing up waterfalls and, you know, diving down and like seeing if I could see turtles and, you know, like just, just playing outside um, because I didn't feel like there was any kind of inherent gender to that. The thing about being trans is that there's this obvious thing that is not right in your life, that you know it takes a lot of courage, it's gonna take a lot of courage to like be true to your true self. It's gender. Um, but I think that everybody has the same thing, they just don't know what it's called. It's like just like being really true to themselves or being brave enough to be who they really are or standing up for what they believe or you know all, all these things um, that it's just it's it's hard to like follow your heart and to not care what people are gonna say or to let go of fear. When you're first coming out you don't have a lot of examples of like how someone like you can exist in the world and like mainstream media stuff. It's very isolating and it's, uh, you know you feel very alone. Uh. One of the things about that I feel is a consistent uh, response from people when they get asked that question that have a different gender identity than you know cisgendered people um, is that it doesn't matter how many people you have when you come out a lot of the time you really just feel like you're by yourself. Coming out in Alabama was pretty hard. I was in a college town when I actually came out um, and it's been, it's been pretty tough, like, you know, with like all the different stares and stuff that I get. Like sometimes it feels like, I don't know if they're staring at me because they think I'm pretty or they're staring at me because they think I look weird or they're like, oh, that's a trans person, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's, you always have that anxiety there. Before I was full time, I guess I would say, living in my old life was living a very imprisoned life, it felt like, and I couldn't be myself, couldn't be the person I wanted to be, couldn't dress the way I wanted to dress, could do the things I wanted to do, and felt like I always had to put on a big show for everybody. And to not have to do that anymore, to not have to put on a show, to be able to just be yourself is the most satisfying thing in the world and the best decision I ever made. I've been really, really lucky. I know a lot of folks that have had hard roads. Mine's actually been quite the opposite. Um, you know, the expression first world problems, that's about all that the, the trans stuff has given me. Um, you know, I was lucky. I was surrounded by a lot of friends that were very supportive and in those kind of early days nurtured me along. And, and you know, they were very supportive and they weren't looking down on it. They were very helpful with it. Um, you know, similarly in my work, when I transitioned, they actually brought in a, um, they brought in a, a, a counselor to actually work with the staff in advance of me coming, coming out so they could prepare them so they could understand the issues. I've always had this shell in trying to fit in the gender norm. Um, so, you know, I was very masculine when I was growing up in high school and then slowly I be started becoming more in touch with my femininity and so that evolved into something that is now you know now I'm everything that's feminine I, I totally love knowing I'm fully transitioned how I want to be transitioned makes me feel complete most of my family accepted me uh, in fact the first person I came out to was my father because I knew he would be the hardest person to tell and he would take it the hardest and if I can tell him I could tell anyone. So I told him, and he had the, the same reaction in my head I played over and over again. It was terrible. But that was also a weight off my shoulders. Then I told my job, and I told my best friends, I told the rest of my family, and uh, surprisingly, most of them were really accepting. I transitioned when I was in my teens, so my late teens, and um, I'm really thankful for that. I'm really thankful for my family because they were, I mean, some more than others were more understanding and um, they always knew because I always looked like a girl my whole life. Every point that I was worried about, which was my family and 
um, and mostly um, work, I, I felt like I might, you know, experience some opposition, but none at all. I came out when I was 15, so I was, I think, my sophomore year of high school, so I really didn't risk that much, I guess, looking back. I mean, I went to a super conservative high school and everything, but I was just, like, in punk bands and stuff, and everyone ended up in my punk scene, ended up coming out as queer within the last, like, three years. Well, it started when I was in college, and uh, because I realized that people were, like, open-minded, you know? I wasn't in Boise anymore. So uh, I started to, like, um, go out dressed up. But still, it was, like, once a month or once every two months. And it was, like, this, like, special thing. I got a wig and, you know, this, that, and figured out my outfit, you know? It wasn't until maybe um, three, four years ago that I finally started to, like, get rid of my boy clothes and just, like, be like, this is who I am all the time. One day I just, I just woke up and I felt like doing it, so... I just kind of just started putting on makeup and like I looked at myself in pictures and I thought I looked, I felt like really good so I just went with it and as my hair got longer and I figured out my style and makeup and all that it just like I just feel so much more comfortable and so much more like myself. I made my transition as easy as I could for other people by um, adopting fashions and styles that lent themselves to androgyny. So I was a goth kid for a little while. I was into the industrial music scene for a little while because I could put on these things and people, oh, they, you know, they could write it off as something else. I got it to the point where I could pay for, you know, transition and name change and hormone therapy and all these things. And people at that point went, eh, you know, she's like, okay, whatever. Before I transitioned, I was. I was completely miserable. I was about to end it all. I was on drugs, trying to stay in my head. Ever since I transitioned, pretty much all that stopped. I, I, I just felt more comfortable as myself. <clears throat> and being a trans woman is kind of secondary to me, to being a woman. The people, they think that a trans girl, so that's all that that person has going on in their life is being trans, you know? it's like. Uh, they they have no concept of like does this person like to read books you know what kind of movies does this person like uh, where does this person come from you know like what does this person like to do in their spare time does this person play any sports they just think this person is trans period that's the only thing it was a lot harder when I was first uh, figuring stuff out uh, where I came from was in the south and there just wasn't a lot of examples of people like me around uh, so I didn't really have a guidebook of uh, what to do or what to expect. A lot of doctors didn't know what to do with me, uh, especially because I was so young, because I came out when I was like 17 or 18, uh, and they did not want to touch it because they are like, oh, you know, like, this could be a mistake, you might regret it later, you know, that kind of thing. So it was very challenging to get uh, medical care, um, to get on hormones, to get my name changed, like all that kind of stuff, um, as well as the social stigma around it, um, around being a transsexual finding clothes that fit the way that I want them to, that appear the way that I want them to on my body, uh, you know, employment, filling out applications with work and then handing them your ID and your name being different than the name that you go by, uh, you know, things like that that are, you know, they, they, they're small things, but they end up being a pain in the ass. My mother and uh, stepfather don't really accept my lifestyle or the way that I look or the way that I dress. That's been very difficult and disappointing. Um, I sometimes go out to places and can feel scrutiny. I can look at people's faces and not see warm welcome. It wasn't difficult for me to come out. It really wasn't because, because I always was very male identified, even growing up and all of those things. And then when I did start to change and when I did start to take the hormones, I remember calling my parents right away, even though I had kind of lost contact with them. And just telling them I'm having, which was what we called many years ago, a sex change. And I said, I'm having a sex change. And I remember my mom was just being like, well, if that's what you need to make you happy. Everyone in my life who I told or who, under, who, who I presented this to, not one single person was like, that's weird or that's except for the gay women's community. Those people, the gay women, friends of mine, immediately stopped being my friend. 
fast forward now, many of those gay women are thinking about going through the change and have, you know, contacted me about how to do it and how, what kind of doctor to see and how, you know, and I think that's just things coming full circle. My mom thought of us like a lesbian forever and then, you know, I kind of came out about it a few years ago. I think it was like four or five years ago. And my dad took it really well. Um, my mom still having a very difficult time. She's, yeah, she's, she's just more like female stuff now than she did before and using my, you know, f full birth name usually. She just has a nickname and so she's more like trying to push it. Um, but my dad's been my biggest support and I think it's because um, of his dad's sister was brother uh, because she was like one of the pioneers in the trans community. So it helped him a lot, like understand and you know, deal with men. He knew that I was getting, you know, crap from all ends of my family. So this really opened things up and he was there. He was like total papa bear. He's like, I'm gonna fucking be there for my kid. My family had a very hard time with it. We didn't speak for several years. Um, we're now in better terms now, but you know, it was a it was a long journey to like get to that point. My dad had passed away a couple years prior and my when I came out to my mom it was a bit of a blowout in the sense that she kind of said, you're my daughter, I can't, I can't call you a he, I can't call you a male name, you know, you're my daughter. And I kind of walked out on her. Uh, I bailed for a while and kind of just said, you know, I'll come home when you're ready to deal with this and you're ready to approach this, I need your support. And it took a long time, but you know, now she's incredible. She's my best friend, so. I'm very lucky, but it takes time. It's a transition for everybody involved. I told my mom, I realized, I was like, oh, you know, I'm coming out and I like this girl. And my mom just kind of, she was like, oh, okay, yeah. I kind of figured that, you, <laughs> you know? And I was like, well, I wish you had told me because all that practice stuff, you know, I wouldn't have had to do like all of that other stuff. I was in the Navy for two and a half years and uh, I had a four year contract though. And uh, so I did boot camp and A school um, for, I was a gunner's mate. And uh, then I got sent off to Japan, which was my first choice, which was cool. Out of about 280 people, about 280 people knew on the boat. And everyone was cool that, you know, my transition that I wanted to pursue. I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't take hormones. I couldn't get any kind of surgeries I, would, I wanted. I, I could cross dress, but it wasn't fulfilling for me. Two and a half years came by and I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I found a loophole. I went through all the chain of command to get exactly what I would I, I required with paperwork and all that to get out. And then um, I got out November of 2010 and Right when that happened, I went back home to Texas. Two months later, I started hormones. Well, hormones, um, when you go through, um, like, taking testosterone injections, it's essentially like going through a second puberty, <laughs> just as an adult. So it's, you know, you get a lot of the same emotional stuff that goes on with that. You get a lot of physical changes, um, things like your voice deepening, like your voice will crack, uh, things like that. You might get acne. You might uh, get increased body hair, um, weight gain or muscle gain. Uh, these are all different. Everybody's a little different of like what kind of stuff happens to them. Their sex drive might increase. They make you sit down and like watch a movie. They're like this is what's gonna happen. You know, you gotta be ready. You gotta be ready for all this stuff, and you're just so like pumped about it. You know, you prep yourself for it, and then there's you know there's it's some of the stuff that your body goes through is rough. I started taking hormones. I think it was the 25th of January 2014. So actually this week is, this is my six month is today. It helps my energy level. Um, it does bring my mood up. Um, sometimes I can feel a little bit of an up and down, but for the most part, it really helps my mood boost as opposed to bring me like get the rage or anything like that. I don't really, I don't have that. I felt a little bit of a difference in my voice. Nothing nothing dramatic, but a little bit within the first couple months and a little tiny bit of like something on my, you know, my upper lip a little bit, but minimal. The last couple months is when it's really been much more dramatic. I felt like I kind of hit a plateau. Um, 
a couple after a couple months and then this last couple of weeks I've kind of seen a lot more kind of really quick probably like within like a half an hour I can feel more um, energy it's nothing crazy but I can feel a little bit more uh, a little bit more energized than I was before um, yeah I get hungry <laughs> I get hungry real quick I do subcutaneous instead of intramuscular that's how I've always done it from the beginning. I did it in uh, the top of my leg. Like a couple weeks ago, I switched to doing it in my stomach instead. And they advised, they said, why don't you start with doing it in your leg? Or they asked, I think they asked me my preference and they said normally people will start doing it in your leg. So I did that and then last time I went to my appointment, we talked about it a little bit and he said, I think that we'd see better and more stable results if we tried to do it in your stomach instead. So we're just trying that to see how that goes. You have all these physical things changing, you have your emotional changes happening and then you also you know have your socialization through life having to like relearn how to do everything again because there's some things that uh, you might have been ex able to get away with when you were I you know perceived to be female and when you're moving through the world as a man some of those things aren't acceptable anymore it's just like all these things that you don't necessarily expect happen and you just kind of have to relearn everything it's like being reborn in a way hormones have actually brought me a lot of confidence and got rid of my anxiety and just really mellowed me out. Hormones make me feel alive. Totally alive. Like I can tell you that I can't ever imagine not having to take my hormones. And I, I think that I've said to partners and to people that even if the doctors tell me that I'm going to have health problems or these things if I don't stop taking the hormones, I honestly think I'd rather have a shorter life and a quality of life that I have than to remove the hormones from my body and have a longer life. I think a lot of people won't understand it because I'm on hormones. They're like, well, you're on hormones. Why why do you feel both? I've, I haven't really come out about it a lot. I've just, you know, to a couple close friends, you know, I've, I've got support from that. So that's, you know, comforting. I did pellets once, but I guess that doesn't really count. So... What are pellets? Pellets are these time-released... Uh, testosterone basically yeah they're pellets they're these tiny little things and they cut open your butt cheek and insert uh depending on how many months it's supposed to be the amount of pellets but i didn't notice any changes or anything from them so i i just figured they didn't work um so i waited about a year or two and then i started uh testosterone shots i do intramuscular uh some guys uh do it in their butt or their their thigh and i've seen guys do the, the back or the side of the thigh i have a friend that does the side um i do the top and i don't know i just like being able to see what i'm doing i usually feel my shot like 15 minutes after i do it um changes i think it really varies on dose and maybe how much estrogen you produce and if you've had a hysterectomy or not uh, my results have been slower, um, and then I, you know, when I had my hysterectomy, I noticed a lot more changes than I had had before. I was always anxious and, like, super depressed, and now I'm just, uh, I'm more confident, um, I'm mellower, uh, I feel really good all the time. Hormones didn't do the effects that a lot of my friends or people I've talked to, I never had those effects of, um, becoming a bitch. I was always a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need a hormone to help me. Um, I loved what it did to my body. I loved what it did to my skin. I loved what it did to everything. And um, about five years ago, I had to stop because I didn't have uh, ways of getting it. And medically, they were not wanting me to be on it for some fact that I am. I have uh, breast cancer on both sides of my family. Um, on my mom and my dad's side, so it's very rapid, and I don't want to, um, they didn't want to induce anything, being that I was, you know, going, pushing 30, and so, um, I've been off and just recently got back on. I would love to be able to somehow help, help transsexuals and transgenders, um, get some kind of specific hormone or hormone regimen made specifically for them instead of having to take uh, supplements, you know, to, as having to take stuff that's made for other, like spironolactone is a diuretic, you know, it's for like different reasons than what we take it for. Testosterone blockers is what we take it for. Uh, progesterone is, is 
really helps with the secondary sexual characteristics. They affect you in many different ways. They affect you in a lot of physical ways and emotional too. You're very, at least in my case, a lot more sensitive to all kinds of emotions, whether it be joy, sadness, frustration, anything. Just emotions seem to affect me more. For me, you know, I had automatic results almost, you know, so, but I've also had quite a bit of plastic surgery to accompany it. <laughs> but it does, if you're supposed to transition, then it, it just makes you feel complete, happy, like it's, you're on an antidepressant or something. I don't have a steady healthcare provider, um, so I don't have a steady endocrinologist either. So that makes it where I can't get the prescription stuff, so I have to get the non-prescription stuff, and that's what the vials are that you have to deal with filtering through the glass and all of that um, dangerous stuff. Um, when I had the vials, I didn't I, my doctor just said, hey, do it this way, and I was like, okay, and just, you just stick it into the little rubber thing and pull it out, just like a, you know, a regular vial. Um, this way, my uh, one of my girlfriends taught me how to do it uh, after I had to start using um, hormones off of, from off of the internet. I just go off of what I used to take from the prescription. Um, girls that don't ever go to a doctor and never get like what they need to be prescribed, that's really getting dangerous because then you're just total guesswork. When I first got on hormones, back when I was doing it with the uh, vials, um, I've been shooting it ever since I got um, on estrogen. I just recently started pills and shooting, like pills on the days I don't shoot. But when I first started, I think it was just the accomplishment of finally getting on them and finally having that source of hormones being fed in my body again. Hormones, for me, first, uh, it was more of an accomplishment thing of just like finally being able to get that, that other, the hormone that I, that I wanted that got cut off by the, by the boy hormones to be back in a, a steady supply in my body. It wasn't ever like a, like a physical sensation. It's just like a mental thing. It's like, okay, now I'm on my hormones. So yes, now I'm going to be Getting, now I'm gonna be feminizing and getting my, 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 my body structure changes and uh, female fat distribution and your skin becoming more translucent and soft, of course, and hair and, you know, all the pretty stuff. Once you start getting that, it's like, yeah, it, it's something, it's something great. And I don't wanna sound like, I don't wanna sound messed up, but if you're real transsexual, getting that will, will say, okay, Cool. If I have to stick a needle in my leg every fucking week to get some to 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 look more like myself over time, hey, whatever. Got to make a sacrifice. I'm completely fucking terrified of needles. Gender queer is typically reserved for people who um, feel like they are not quite male identified and not quite female identified. And the best way that I've heard people describe it is um, that. They are neither male or female, but also at the same time, a little bit of both. There's a lot of words that uh, kind of have overlap or have their own definitions within. I, I gravitated towards genderqueer early on, but I also like androgynous and I like non-binary, which now is coming up as NB, like letter N, letter B, or spelled out NB, like E-N-B-Y. Um, which I love the evolution of words. I most uh, identify with trans, masculine, and genderqueer. Um, I also identify with queer. I don't identify as an F to M exactly. I have at points in my life and I don't anymore. Um, I think for me, when I decided not to transition, I was sort of in a limbo of trying to figure out exactly how to identify myself. I was identifying as F to M, but not with any intention to physically transition. And so for me, it took some time to become comfortable with genderqueer because I was not comfortable with that term when I sort of first heard it and it was first being used. It was something that I really wanted to reject personally and have over time. Really, it actually fits me best and now it feels totally solidly mine. If I were to choose a gender, I actually wouldn't choose any. Um, and I, for a number of years, that's how I, about it. Um, I didn't feel like a woman. 
um, I, I pretty much came to this when I was in college and I, I was hanging out with some friends and some of them were transitioning to men. And I thought, well, maybe that's me too, because hanging out with them and, and how they interact felt more comfortable than anything else that I knew. So I was like, okay, well, if this feels right, then maybe this is my path also. So for a good summer, I tried to pass as a man and I bind my breasts and I wore baggy um, clothes to try to hide my curves. And I, I, <laughs> I failed, I think, at lo trying to lower my voice and trying to have a swagger. And um, whenever I was third, I took it as a compliment that I was like, it was working sort of. Um, but I quickly realized that I'm not, I'm not a man. Like it just, it felt as much of drag that if I was wearing skirts and dresses. Colton identified as trans and an F to M and had a masculine gender expression and presentation. So I sort of didn't know him in any other incarnation or with any other identity. Now his identity has changed obviously over, it's been more than a decade and it's morphed and changed and evolved. After, you know, exploring what it might be to be a man, I came across a zine that had the word genderfuck in it. And that was totally a light bulb of, and I think around that time I, in searching that I found genderqueer and I was like, okay, this is great. Cause this is fluid. This means that I don't have to pick one right now. I can be whatever I want at any given moment. And I think that fluidity validated a lot of questions I had in my own gender. And like, you know, when do I feel comfortable being girlish or whatever? And when do I, when do I not? I identify as uh, genderqueer, more specifically um, non-binary or agendered. So uh, I see my my genders very separate from my my appearance, my presentation of my gender. So um, being very feminine, and you know, like having been born with boobs and a vagina, like it's not so apparent. Like I'm not androgynous you know, or like masculine center. Gender fluid and gender queer are very, um, I feel like they're kind of just different terms that are used to describe kind of the same thing. It just kind of means that like that individual has maybe like a more flexible outlook on gender, um, a more playful outlook on gender. Like they're interested in experimenting with gender depending on how they wake up in the morning, how they're feeling, like maybe they're gonna put on a pair of heels, maybe they're gonna put on a pair of like combat boots you know? and they feel comfortable kind of being like in that like, that gray area. I would say it's like next to impossible to really live without a gender in day-to-day -day society because we're constantly interacting with other people. And um, if I don't have a gender, then I'm assigned one through through perceptions of, of how I look and how I act. I'm feeling like oh, my gender is being placed into a certain label or a certain box and if I don't say anything, then people just keep on assuming this. I had like a magic wand to change whatever I wanted to about my body. I would like most definitely have a penis. Like that's a part of me that I've known for a long time. But I still feel like really strongly attached to my feminine appearance and presentation. I, it empowers me. They and them pronouns, they've been around for a while. The, this pronoun use of a singular they has been, uh, in grammatically correct English since Shakespearean times. Um, it wasn't until uh, a sort of um, patriarchal movement of like he, you know, when we had a lot of things like a, the child goes to school, he needs nurture and development. Almost, you know, the child is like kind of a default male. So then like this uh, narrative voice became the default was male with um, male pronouns. And later on, um, I believe in the 70s, you started to have like PC awareness, a politically correct awareness of including women within this kind of default child male kind of uh, model. And then you started to see things like he slash, slash she, you know, on, on the page, you know, a child, he slash she goes to school. And, and that, I mean, reading that out loud becomes more grammatically uh, a tumbling block than saying they or them. Um, there is a context needed when you talk about a person using gender neutral pronouns. Um, I, oftentimes that context can start with saying their name first and then using the pronoun within it. One thing I also notice is that the more you use it, the easier it becomes and then it becomes more of second nature. And I think that's just an indicative of language anyway, is that it's a practiced uh, 
communication. I've had scary situations with the bathroom and I usually carrying a knife on me now. And that's why, like, I used to be about 90 pounds, really scrawny. So I got more into powerlifting and bodybuilding and I put on some size so I look intimidating when I go places and I don't get messed with anymore. I used to get in fights and, you know, whatever when I was in high school and people think I was a gay guy or, you know, whatever, shows and stuff. There's some places I'm not comfortable in if a lot of people are not um, understanding of what butch means or gender queer. I feel that um, it's just as time goes on, I'm feeling better in public places, but um, not everywhere is open and friendly to uh, a butch identified woman like myself. Recently, I've had my gender challenged by the courts in the United States. And so for me, that's been a huge hardship for me because I always just felt that I did everything right. I did my physical change. I had the surgeries that I wanted to have. I had all my legal paperwork changed. And then all of a sudden, I get presented with proof that you're really male. I, I question myself and I put the question out there, will I ever fully be male? Will I ever fully be male to the world or to, for myself, yes, but will I continue to be questioned forever in the rest of my life? You know, being trans does bring a lot of hardship. Uh, employment is always tough. Uh, safety is an issue. Um, going out with friends, dating is a big issue. There's some prejudices built into our society against somebody that's trans. Um, just the difficulty of getting a documentation that matches a gender marker can be a real problem. I don't know any trans women who are like in their 20s with a stable job. I know way more trans women who are like staying on someone's couch. It's really, the employment thing is so I think over, glossed over because it's not a fun issue to talk about. Not like gay marriage where it's, oh, it's about love. Everyone needs to love each other. That sells. I don't really speak to my parents too often. I haven't seen my dad in two, three years, probably. So giving up family to be happy with who I want to be, it was the most difficult part. I've had to cut some people out of my life. Uh, and just the, the whole mother thing has been really hard. When I was 25, I found out that I was born with both sexes. And my family knew the whole entire time, but never told me. And still judged me for my choice of becoming a woman when they knew this was going to be something that I could face down the road. I don't know, my mom is still trying to like wrap her head around it. She still has problems calling me the correct name, the correct pronouns. I was fired from a job that I really loved. I was disowned by my family. I haven't seen my baby sister in 12 years. I haven't seen anybody in my family other than my mother in 12 years. I don't know, being trans in America is fucked up. It's not, it's not a like, happy, beautiful experience unless you come from privilege and wealth and a family that embraces you going through that process. And I don't, I don't think I speak for all trans people um, and their experiences, but in my own experience, it's, it's been very complicated. I lost half of my family. Um, my whole father's side. And it, that really kind of sucks because they raised me for 14 years. My personality changed in ways I didn't expect it to. I think a lot of people, before they start transition, assume that, well, I'll basically be the same person in a different body. And then, you know, my body and mind will sort of match up the way I think they should. But for me, it was an experience of just, I'm a completely different person. The person who I was before doesn't exist anymore, and I didn't expect that. And that was interesting and challenging and exciting at the same time. The only hardship I have that I've actually been dealing with has been probably love and relationships. It's hard to get someone to accept you for being a transgender. Um, and after that, then it's like, okay, trying to be accepted for being in the adult industry. If they accept one, they're not going to accept the other. I'll go on dates with guys and they won't know that I'm trans. <laughs> and once I tell them, like, some are still cool with it, others are not so interested. So dating is kind of just like, just totally, absolutely weird. Hmm. Uh, the, the dysphoric aspects of, of some of the basics of being male, facial hair, 
body hair, things like that, uh, even your own male smells and stuff like that can really drive you crazy. Uh, and so it's the, the insecurity and the, the um, internal issues, which are oftentimes uh, developed by the external issues and people saying, oh, well, you're not a real woman. I feel like if you're like actually trans, like if you're an actual trans woman, then you always prefer the term woman. I don't really care too much about the words, you know? If someone calls me like a she-male or tranny or whatever, like it doesn't really bother me. 10 years ago, faggot was socially acceptable. You could hear someone say faggot on TV and it was normal. Where now you can still say a trans woman's a man on TV, but I just feel like it's changing with the times. In 10 years, I don't think that's gonna be socially acceptable. Some words are um, definitely offensive. Like, to me, like, if someone called me a tranny, I would be very, very upset. I don't get uh, my panties in a wad over any of them because people are gonna say what they say. You know, within data, you talk about the idea of adding an attribute to something. And each one of those labels is really just a label. It's something you do to kind of, depending on context, try to narrow in to help explain the story better. Sometimes the message you need to communicate is, dude, I'm a woman. You know what I mean? I'm no different than any other any other woman you're gonna deal with. I'm as temperamental or as, you know, thoughtful and caring or any of those things that you're gonna think of for a genetic woman. If I'm dealing with somebody that doesn't accept me on that level, then that has to become the focus of language. I'm trans. I won't deny that I'm a trans woman. Uh, someone asks, I tell. There's, there's a lot of people that don't feel like they're able to tell people or they're afraid of what society will think of them. I know I feel like the whole trans asterisk umbrella has become so open and inclusive as to almost feel like I'm not sure which of these words is actually best used to identify me within it. You can call me anything you want to call me but don't call me he and don't call me it. I like to be called a girl because that's how I feel like I really am but label wise you know I am a transgender woman. A lot of people, especially men, they, they use the, the term transvestite. I wouldn't be categorized as a transvestite because, you know, you think of the person on Rocky Horror Picture Show, you know, just dressing up in drag, basically, and I live my life like this. This is me 24-7. Transsexuals are not cut from the same cloth as, say, cross-dressers or transvestites and I don't like being grouped with them particularly. I have nothing against cross-dressers and transvestites, but uh, I don't like the fact that since we're grouped, a lot of the general population can't tell the difference. I'm all of those things or titles or whatever people would like to call me. Nothing bothers me in that sense. I know who I am, so whatever terms people feel comfortable using to you know, point out to someone like myself, it's fine. If someone says, oh, you're transsexual, that doesn't bother me, but if people start saying, like, uh, tranny or she or lady or whatever, like, the really derogatory terms, it's like, that offends me. And I feel like if you are trans, that should offend you. I've never really cared too much about semantics. Like, I, I'm more generally concerned about where people are at when they make those statements. I don't take offense to any word at all, whatsoever. Not even context. Um, I'm one of those assholes that just believes in words purely for the sake of words. she -male and tranny, I think, have come up a lot in recent conversations. Me personally, I'm probably one of the few, I don't care. I really honestly don't care. I'm comfortable in who I am and that those kind of labels don't bother me. Not to mention that we call each other tranny in where I'm from. You know, it might not be the norm everywhere, but that's how we address each other. So I don't see why it would be so wrong for someone else to do it. My favorite word is tranny and so many people right now hate the word. <laughs> and I never ever hated the word. I use it, I call myself that. Me and my girlfriends that are trans call ourselves that. We as a community have done a very bad job of explaining who and what we are because there are so many voices. This is not a unified chorus of this is our experience. We've all got something different. 
it's other transgender people that are more anal about terminology than the general public. And to be honest with you, there's so many different terminologies now that I don't think the general public knows what to think of us. I know that there are certain people that like they're, they think this word means this and this and this, and this word means this and this and this, and this word means this and this and this. And you can't use one word for the wrong thing and they get like really like, you know, torn up about it. I am all kinds of different names, but however people want to refer to me as, as long as it's not a male pronoun, I'm good with it. When I find somebody that, that clearly isn't being malicious, they just don't know. To be able to teach them about the language, to be able to walk them through and help them understand and maybe be better the next time they meet somebody. To me, that's part of the journey. So I actually have a real job. I work in an office uh, and it's really boring, but it's like steady and it has like health insurance and all that stuff. So, um, and then in my spare time for a hobby, I make porn. I'm an adult entertainer, a transsexual adult entertainer. And um, before that, I was working different jobs. Um, where I'm from, I'm from San Francisco. Well, my job currently is I'm an adult performer, entertainer. Um, it's definitely one of my passions, not the passion. I'm freelance um, motion graphics designer, so I tend to hop around from company to company, which is kind of nice. Um, through, throughout the transition, like, I didn't really feel stressed out about one particular job. While I was a hairdresser for eight years, I actually still do that in the privacy of my home, actually. Uh, but I also work in the adult industry where I um, actually control my own business. I've been working as a fashion designer in the fashion industry for the last 10 years. I started my own company with um, some friends uh, about seven years ago, which I've now left and I'm working on new projects, but I've worked across the whole range of the fashion industry. Uh, my day job, I work as a, an analyst for a marketing company. Um, and then nights, weekends, I'm a porn star, adult entertainer.